Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see you all here uh, this evening. Uh, a warm welcome to those who are visiting with us. Uh, just a few announcements uh, for this evening as we, uh, before we come to worship. So Southern Presbytery will meet tomorrow evening at 7.30 uh, in Newry. And then Wednesday evening is our midweek meeting at 8 p.m. and that will be taken by Paul Flynn. And then the services next Lord's Day will be taken again by uh, Reverend Stephen Steele. And then just a reminder that our next uh, monthly fellowship after the evening service will be on the 31st uh, of July. So finally, just glad to have uh, Stephen back with us again. Uh, Stephen, thank you for bringing God's word to us uh, this morning. And we look forward now uh, to him leading us in worship once again. Well, thank you again for the welcome. Uh, we come to worship God at turning to the words of Psalm, Psalm 97. Uh, Psalm 97, and it's the first seven verses. Psalm 97, the first seven verses. The world looks like it's spinning out of control. Uh, people feel helpless. They suspect they're being lied to and they worry about where it's all going to end. Uh, and in the face of all that, what is our message this evening? What is our message to bring to the world? Verse 1, God reigns, let the earth be glad. The throne of the universe is not empty. Uh, God is in control. Uh, evil will not go unpunished, verse 3. Fire goes before him and his foes. It burns up round about. All those who have devoted their lives to uh, serving and following after worthless things will be put to shame, verse 7. All who serve graven images, confounded, let them be. Who do of idols boast themselves, let shame upon them fall. And a, a, a warning, if we are devoting ourselves to things that, that will not outlast this world, uh, that we are wasting our effort. Uh, but if uh, we are uh, devoted to serving the, the God of gods and the Lord of lords, uh, then our efforts are not wasted uh, because our God reigns and one day he will be seen to reign as at the, knee of, at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So Psalm 97, 1 to 7, we'll stand to sing and if you're able, remain standing for prayer.
Lord our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you alone are God. Uh, there is uh, only one God, and although the, the name God's is at times applied in Scripture to, to angels, to human rulers, to uh, demonic spirits, uh, these are all created things. You alone are the uncreated God. You alone are the self-existent one. Uh, you uh, do not owe your beginning to anyone else. Uh, you are the God who names other things, uh, but you are the God who is not named by others. And we worship you today. Uh, we thank you for the gift of the Lord's Day. Uh, we thank you for a day of refreshment, a day of rejuvenation. Uh, we thank you for a day of, of recalibration to remind ourselves of the things that are truly important uh, because so much in this world is fading away. Uh, but but the things of God are eternal. And so uh, we pray that you will help us, uh, that you will equip us through all that we've been able to do this day uh, for the challenges of a new week, uh, that you'll help us to set our minds on you. Uh, as we uh, look out on the new week that lies ahead, we are, are conscious of the challenges. Uh, we are, are conscious Conscience that we have uh, an enemy, uh, we, we are aware that the evil one uh, will tempt us in various ways and uh, we, we do confess how often we, uh, we fall short. Uh, the, the writer to, to the Hebrews says that you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood and, and so often our, our resistance is, is so, uh, so temporary uh, before we give in. As we think of the parable of the sower, and we we are conscious uh, we're, we're we're conscious of uh, the fact that uh, that we uh, must give an account to you of how we hear, and and while we we may uh, resist when uh, trouble or persecution comes uh, on account of the word uh, while we might never give in to that we we realize the more subtle danger in many ways of the the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the the, the choking effect that they have on us and on the the word that is sown in our lives and how it proves unfruitful uh, and so we pray that that would not be the case for any of us, that it would not be uh, the case that we are unfruitful, uh, but we pray that we would uh, bear fruit. We pray that the, the fruit of the Spirit would be seen more and more in our lives. And we pray that you'd make us fruitful as well in, in terms of congregations. We, we pray that we would see others uh, brought in to the number and added in. Uh, be with those who are unable to be with us tonight for reasons of, of infirmity, uh, old age, ill health. Uh, we pray for those who are away on holiday as well. We pray that they will know uh, a particular uh, refreshment where they are. Uh, and uh, so we do pray that you'd be with us as we uh, meet together now. We pray that your spirit would be at work among us. We pray that the Lord Jesus would be lifted up uh, and uh, that being uh, lifted up, that he might draw all men to himself. Uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, please be seated. Uh, we turn in God's word now to the second last chapter of Second Samuel. Second Samuel 23, having looked at the first seven verses this morning, we come to look at the rest of this chapter now, uh, but we'll read the whole chapter together. Uh, we have in the, the second uh, part of the chapter, the, the longer part of the chapter, uh, a list of names. Uh, not, not quite a genealogy, but, but a list of David's mighty men and uh, 
Perhaps these, these are lists that we, we, we maybe come across and we think there's not much, there's not much fruitful for us here. Uh, but, but someone has said that maybe all these lists of names in the Bible are a reminder that God never tires to name the names of his people. Uh, and so even, even that is an encouragement. When we come to any uh, list of names in the Bible, the, the people we don't know, uh, many of them, the names mean nothing to us, uh, just as our names mean nothing to, to most Christians in the world. But God knows and no uh, act of service for him goes unnoticed. So Second Samuel 23, and we'll read the whole chapter. Now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, and the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel, said, the spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spake to me. He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God, and he shall be as the light of the morning. When the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds, as the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. Although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure. For this is all my salvation and all my desire, although he make it not to grow. But the sons of Belial shall be all of them as thorns thrust away, because they cannot be taken with hands. But the man that shall touch them must be fenced with iron and the staff of a spear, and they shall be utterly burnt with fire in the same place. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. The Tachmanite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains, the same was Adino the Esnite. He lifted up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Duru, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines that were gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand cleaved onto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. And after him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Hararite, And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines. And the Lord wrought a great victory. And three of the thirty chief men went down and came to David in the harvest time onto the cave of Adullam. And the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Rephaim. And David was then in a hold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men broke through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but put it out unto the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things did the three mighty men. And Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zeruah, was chief among three. And he lifted up his spear against three hundred and slew them, and had the name among three. Was he not most honorable of three? Therefore he was their captain. Howbeit he attained not unto the first three. And Beniah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done many, many acts, he slew two lion like men of Moab. He went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in time of snow. And he slew an Egyptian, a goodly man, and the Egyptian had a spear in his hand. But he went down to him with a staff and plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand. And slew him with his own spear. These things did Benaiah the son of Jehoiada. And had the name among three mighty men. He was more honourable than thirty. But he attained not to the first three. And David set him over his guard. Ashael the brother of Joab was one of the thirty. Elhanan the son of Duru of Bethlehem. Shammah the Haradite. 
Eleka, the Horodite, Helez, the Paltite, Ira, the son of Ekesh, the Tekoite, Abizer, the Anathothite, Mebune, the Hushathite, Salmon, the Ahuhite, Mahare, the Nethophathite, Heleb, the son of Bana, a Nephophathite, Ittai, the son of Rabbi, of Gibeah, of the children of Benjamin, Benaiah, the Pirithonite, Hidai, of the brooks of Gash, Abi Albon, the Arbathite, Azmephath, the Barthumite, Elihaba, the Shalbonite, of the sons of Jashin, Jonathan, Shama, the Hararite, Ahayim, the son of Sharar, the Hararite, Eliphelet, the son of Ashmai, the son of the Machites, Eliam, the son of Ahitophel, the Gileonite, Hezrai, the Carmelite, Parai, the Arbite, Egal, the son of Nathan, of Zuba, Bani, the Gabite, Zeleg, the Ammonite, Nahari, the Berothite, armor bearer to Joab, the son of Zeruah, Ira, an Ithrite, Gareb, an Ithrite, Uriah, the Hittite, 37 in all. Amen. Well, we turn uh, now to praise God, singing uh, another part of Psalm 72, uh, which we finished with this morning. Psalm 72, a picture of godly kingship, uh, which is prophetic of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, verse 8, uh, we're, we're not singing it, uh, but, but it talks about this kingdom extending from, from sea to sea. Uh, that's actually the, the name of uh, the, the magazine of the New Canadian RP Church. Uh, you, you may be aware that uh, up until uh, recently, there was uh, an RP Church of North America, including those in the United States and Canada, uh, but the Canadian churches, they've now formed into their own uh, denomination, uh, the Reformed Presbyterian Church of Canada, uh, that they might uh, better uh, speak the word of God into the nation they find themselves in. Uh, and so we, we will pray uh, after, uh, afterwards for this, this new uh, RP Church of, of Canada. Uh, Carla's dad, of course, is, is now a minister over there. He did a, did a placement here in this congregation with, with David Silversides many, many, many years ago uh, before he went to Airdrie uh, and then before he went to Canada. Uh, in recent years, they've had a few congregations from other denominations uh, join uh, the church in Canada. Uh, there's a church in Toronto, uh, which originally would have been, been a free church. Uh, Kenneth Stewart, who's in Glasgow at the minute, he, or in, in Stornoway at the minute, he, he uh, was pastor there in Toronto for a while. So it's now part of the RP Church. And more recently, the, uh, the Associate Presbyterian Church in Vancouver, again, part of a Scottish denomination. Uh, it, it now is part of the RP Church of, of Canada uh, as well. Uh, and so there are, there are a few expats out there, uh, but they're, they're seeking uh, to, uh, to be a, a Canadian denomination who, who are training uh, Canadian men and sending them out into that vast country. Uh, but uh, coming to Psalm 72, we'll be singing from verses 11 through 14, 11 through 14, and, and particularly uh, to notice a, a line that we'll come back to uh, in our sermon later on, uh, that the, the blood of, of the saints is precious in, in the sight of the Lord Jesus uh, so Psalm 72, 11 through 14, uh, if you're able, we'll stand to sing and remain standing for prayer.
us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for these words that we have been able to sing, uh, which speak uh, prophetically of the reign of the Lord Jesus, uh, who will reign from sea to sea. And one day that reign will have to be recognized by all, uh, that if uh, men and uh, women will not recognize that reign uh, willingly in this life, uh, that one day they will have to do it unwillingly. Uh, but, uh, but you are the God who, who does not uh, desire that any should perish. And uh, we as your people uh, share that desire. And so we, we would pray that you would bless our efforts as we seek to reach out with the gospel uh, we pray for uh, this congregation, uh, particularly uh, we pray that you would bless uh, the, the efforts that they have had during the week to reach out with the gospel for those uh, thousands of tracts that were given out in Scarva. Uh, we, we give thanks as well for the opportunity that their pastor had to uh, speak uh, with folk here uh, on the 12th here in Loch Brickland around about the church building and we pray that you would bless uh, these these tracks and uh, these conversations uh, to to bring people to a, a knowledge of saving faith we pray uh, not simply for this congregation, we, we pray for uh, the other churches in this presbytery, some represented here this evening. Uh, we pray that you would bless and encourage them in their efforts to reach out. And uh, we, we pray uh, particularly for the Southern Presbytery as they meet this week and uh, have to to, to deal with, with this uh, difficult matter of the resignation of Paul Flynn. Uh, we pray uh, for the presbytery. We pray that you'd give them great wisdom. Uh, we pray for, for Paul and Faith and their children at this time. We pray for the congregation of Rath Freiland. Uh, we pray that you would be at work in all these things. And we pray that you would give great wisdom and great grace in the midst of it all. And as we have sung of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus extending from sea to sea, uh, we thank you for the vision that there is in Canada uh, that the name of the Lord Jesus would be recognized from sea to sea of that great land. Uh, we thank you for their recent constitution as a, a denomination in their own right. Uh, we thank you for uh, how you have led them to step out in faith, uh, leaving the, the many, uh, leaving the, the financial safety net in many ways that, that there was as part of, of a bigger denomination. Uh, but we thank you for encouragements already in terms of other uh, congregations coming and, and joining that denomination. And uh, we pray that you'd be with them as they will be stretched in terms of manpower, in terms of resources, as there will be one presbytery covering such a vast nation. Uh, but we pray uh, that uh, we pray that you would turn uh, that nation to its senses. That as the nation of Canada uh, competes with with other nations to be the most progressive nation that that there could be, uh, we pray that that the people there will see the folly of that. We pray that they will uh, know the truth of, of the words that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And uh, we pray that you would bring uh, renewal and reformation to that land of Canada. Uh, be with us now as we come to your word. Uh, many of your people no doubt come weary uh, we pray that they would uh, know a, a word from the Lord to encourage them in their walk uh, we ask uh, these things in Jesus name Amen well, please be seated well it will be helpful if you can have Second Samuel 23 open in front of you 
As we mentioned this morning, my plan these next two Lord's Days is to take you through these final two chapters of 2 Samuel. Uh, So we looked at the first seven verses this morning, uh, which we saw uh, are not simply general principles for kingship, though they contain that, uh, but very particularly uh, a prophecy of the Lord Jesus. And uh, we come to to this section now uh, that's often entitled something like, like David's Mighty Men. So 2 Samuel 23, our focus will be on verses 8 uh, to the end of the chapter. We're not always good at recognizing people's service for God. Uh, it's one of the things we're, we're not always good at in the church Maybe it's different here, uh, but let me at least speak generally. Perhaps someone teaches Sabbath school for years, uh, but their preparation and work each week are simply taken for granted. Or someone else cleans the church every week, uh, and the only time anyone ever comments is when they miss a bit. Or someone leads the singing every week. And one week, someone who's never thanked them for doing it complains that they they pitched the psalm too high or they didn't choose the tune that that surely has to go with that psalm. Now, what's the the natural human reaction to receiving criticism like that? Or even simply to to not being thanked? Well, surely the, the natural human reaction is to say, well, fine then, Uh, That's the thanks I get. I'll I'll not do it anymore. Uh, We hear that all the time in the world, don't don't we? Uh, Maybe we're involved in in different committees, organizations, so on, outside the church. People are are criticized for something. They say, that's it. I'm not doing it anymore. Of course, in the church, we're not primarily doing what we're doing for other people. We're commanded through love, serve one another. Uh, So we are to serve one another, but but ultimately our service is to God. As Jesus puts it, when you've done all that you were commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have only done that which was our duty. And yet, and yet, at the same time, All over the Bible, we have people who are recognized for their service to God. And that brings us to the first thing we learn from this list of names in front of us. And that is, your service to the king is not overlooked. Your service to the king is not overlooked. All over the Bible, we have people who are recognized and named Uh, because of their service to God. Jesus himself said to the woman who anointed him in Matthew 26, Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Paul writes to the church in Rome. He says, Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. He tells them, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me. He writes to Timothy, and he says, May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Anesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. Now you might think that when it came to the letters of Paul that were going to be recorded for all time in Scripture, that they wouldn't contain personal references to people we don't know. That's all right, yes, for for the letters that, that Paul wrote. That, that, that didn't become part of Scripture in God's providence, but surely if, if these letters are to be preserved for all time, they shouldn't contain the, the names of, of people we know nothing about. And yet it is as if Paul cannot write to churches without highlighting the names of some of the people who are serving away in them. And the fact that his recognition of individuals and families is recorded is surely because it's meant to be an example to us. If God delights to point out the faithful service of his people, we should do the same.
And if your service to God is wrongly overlooked by God's people, don't let that consume you. But take comfort in the fact that your service is not overlooked by God. Uh, I mentioned earlier in the, in the service uh, a line. It comes from Dale Ralph Davis in his commentary in this chapter where he suggests that maybe the reason that the Bible loves lists is because God never tires of naming the names of his people. God never tires of naming the names of his people. Uh, the list in front of us contains the names of David's mighty men, as are called in verse 8, or his chief men, as are called in verse 13. Uh, they're a little bit like Navy SEALs. They're David's most trusted, most valiant warriors. There's a group of around 30 of them. Uh, it's probably uh, dynamic. Some people would be, would be killed and others would be added into to the group. Uh, and there's three in particular singled out as the most trusted three. Just like with Jesus' disciples, you have the, the 12 disciples, but you also have, have three who were closest to him, Peter, James, and John. And the comparison to, to Jesus is an important one. Because who is David here? He's not just a random historical king. But he's God's covenant king. And so to fight for David was to fight for the kingdom of God in the world. Just like we do today as we fight uh, for Jesus. Uh, though not with sword or, or spear, but with the sword of the spirit. As we fight sin, as we take the gospel out into the world. And Jesus doesn't overlook the work of his servants. Other people may do, but Jesus doesn't. He said to his disciples, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. And in the meantime, we are called to serve him faithfully, even if the day in which we receive that reward uh, may be very far in the future. One thing that we need to realize about the people who served David in this chapter is that they did so at a time when serving David was far from the easy option. These final chapters of 2 Samuel are summary chapters. Uh, they're not necessarily in chronological order. And so verse 13 of our chapter talks about the time David was living in the cave of Adullam. And when was that? Well, that was way back in 1 Samuel 22, when Saul was still king. David had been anointed king by Samuel at that point when they were in the cave. He, he was God's choice for king, but he wasn't yet on the throne. He hadn't yet been publicly recognized as king. And we're in a similar position today. Jesus is king but most people don't recognize that. After all, a crucified Messiah doesn't look very impressive. And yet it is now that we're called to serve him. One day Jesus will split the skies and return. Every eye will see him. But it will be too late to start serving him then. Rather, what will count is whether we served him when his cause wasn't popular. And so I trust that, that right from the beginning tonight, this sermon will be an encouragement for you to keep serving him even when his cause is unpopular. And for the rest of our time tonight, I, I want to highlight from these verses three situations you could find yourself in where you might need some encouragement to keep going. So having seen firstly that your service to the king is not overlooked, uh, we want to look at three situations in the chapter where the temptation to throw in the towel could have been overwhelming. Uh, those three situations are when a particular area of service feels like a waste, uh, whether a waste of your energy or a waste of your gifts. Uh, second situation is when you're serving in an unglamorous situation 
And the final situation is when you're left serving on your own. I wonder, do any of those scenarios feel close to home for anyone here? Do you feel like you're wasting or have wasted your energy? Do you think that the place that you are isn't the ideal place to serve God? And do you ever think, I could just do with a bit of support? It can be hard to serve when any one of those three is true. Uh, Any one of them brings with it a high potential for discouragement. But if all three of them are are true or, or seem to be true, it can really be a toxic mix. And so the first of those three situations that we want to look at under our second heading this morning is when it feels like a waste. So so secondly tonight, your service to the king is not overlooked even when it feels like a waste. Probably the most well known of of the different snapshots that are recorded in this chapter is in verses 14 to 17. Uh, where David says, oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. What was behind David's desire? Well, it surely can't have been that they didn't have water where they were. 1 Samuel 22 tells us that there were 400 men with him in the cave of Adullam, and there's no suggestion that lack of water was a problem. Was it just that the water in Bethlehem tasted better? Perhaps. Some have suggested that that what really lay behind David's request was the desire that Bethlehem, uh, which after all was the city of his his birth, would be taken out of Philistine's hands. Uh, And he was longing for the day when that would come about. To be able to go freely into Bethlehem and drink water from its well would mean that Bethlehem had been liberated from the Philistines. Perhaps a little as if someone had said during lockdown, I just wish I could go on a drive to Newcastle. And it might have been more a comment about wishing lockdown was at an end, rather than meaning that Newcastle was the one place they wanted to go in the whole world if given a choice. And if that is the right interpretation, then three of the chief men, they they overhear David and this this longing, and they take him literally, and they go and break through the Philistine camp, and they get water and they bring it back to David. And when he realizes what they've done, and that they've risked their lives to get it, he won't drink it. He, He sees it as blood water because of what they've put on the line to get it for him. In fact, some commentators such as Augustine have seen David's longing for water as a a sinful, uncontrolled desire. And it's only when his men risk their lives to go and get it that he snaps out of it. uh, And he comes to his senses and dedicates it to God. But whatever the reason for his desire, his people's service is precious to him. And that's the big thing to get, is people's service is precious to him. Uh, we sang about it in Psalm 72. It's speaking prophetically of the Lord Jesus. It says that the blood of his people is precious in his sight. And it was the same for David. And so what does he do with this precious water? He pours it on the ground. What ingratitude! That They've gone to such lengths to get it for him, and he pours it out on the ground. Gratitude, not at all, not at all. Rather, he's pouring it out before the Lord. It is not an act of waste, but an act of worship. It's not an act of waste, but an act of worship. When all is said and done, the men who've risked their lives have nothing to show for what they've done. And yet a beautiful thing has happened. They've risked their lives for their king. And David, he realizes that he is not worthy of it. That's why he he pours it out before the Lord as an act of worship. He pours it out before the only one who is truly worthy of such devotion. 
How, how does this touch down in our lives? Well, if you think about it, we don't often have much to show for our service of God. Think about how we spend the Lord's Day, how we devote one whole day and seven to him. And now contrast that with a bank holiday, uh, which we've had a couple of extra ones this year. You, you can get a lot done in a bank holiday uh, if you don't have small children running around. Uh, I'm sure uh, we could do a lot with our Sundays if we use them for ourselves. After, uh, after a whole day doing, doing stuff for us, you know, our, our houses would probably be a bit tidier, our, our gardens in, in better shape. But what do we have after a day of rest and worship and fellowship? Not a lot in tangible terms. Uh, some of you who are, who are maybe studying uh, and maybe you, you've exams and you, you, you take a whole day off and, uh, and your classmates are able to get so much done, maybe, maybe a whole other module covered and you've nothing done. You, you've, you've nothing to show for it. Someone might look at it and say, we're doing the equivalent of pouring water on the ground. But worship is never a waste. Worship is never a waste. And what about that, that day at home when you seem to get nothing done? Uh, maybe uh, mothers at home with, with children. You maybe think, I, I could be, be doing something more productive. And yet, at the end of that apparently unproductive day, those, those small people are, are still alive. And uh, they, they've been uh, looked after. They know they're safe. They, they've been disciplined when they've stepped out of line. They've been watching all the time. They've been learning. They've been loved. They've been trained a little more in the way they should go. But whatever it is, when you're doing it for Jesus, whether that's your worship on the Lord's Day, whether it's your own glamorous work for him through the week. The world says, why this waste? Jesus says, she has done a good thing, a beautiful thing for me. Serving God when it seems like a waste, it's not a waste, it's precious in his sight. But then thirdly, uh, which is the second situation uh, where you might feel discouraged in your service, and that's when you're serving in an unglamorous situation. Let me take you back to July 1848. Uh, there was a failed Irish nationalist rebellion led by the Young Irelanders. It, it culminated in a gunfight which became known as the Battle of Widow McCormick's Cabbage Patch. One of the rebels was shot dead by police. Uh, another was fatally wounded. But even though it was a matter of life and death, it's hard not to, to smile at a battle named after a cabbage patch. Uh, I'm pretty sure no other country in the world uh, would do that. But we're not all called to take on the enemy on glamorous battlefields, as if there is such a thing anyway. And here in verses 11 and 12, we, we have a man called Shama who takes his stand in a plot full of lentils. I'm sure there are people we're all uh, looking forward to meeting in heaven. Uh, people from the Bible, uh, great missionaries, others from church history. But has anyone ever said, you know, I can't wait to meet the guy who defended the lentil field. And yet lentil fields need defended because God's people need fed. And God calls most of his followers to serve him in unglamorous situations. This passage seemed uh, particularly appropriate in some ways to, to us as a congregation in Stranraer. You know, humanly speaking, the town doesn't have a lot going for it, uh, nor is there anything outwardly impressive about the church, either the building or the people. Uh, we could uh, compare ourselves easily to, to other people and say, well, we're just a lentil patch in comparison. Uh, and I'm sure you could do the same here. It, it wouldn't take long to find other churches that you could compare yourselves to. 
and feeling like little more than a lentil patch in comparison. Uh, in the RP Church around the world, we're, we're all pretty much serving God in lentil fields. Uh, some of those lentil fields are just a little bit bigger than others. And the challenge for me and the challenge for you is are we willing to serve God in a lentil field if that's where he calls us to serve him? Would we be more committed to our churches if there was a bit more outwardly attractive about them, if there were more people our own age? In verse 11 here, everyone else fled. Everyone abandoned the lentil field, but Shammah stood his ground. And at times when the enemy is growing in strength, as he seems to be at the moment, and there's nothing particularly attractive about a situation, people will do that. They'll say, I'm out of here. They'll, they'll, they'll say, I'm just going to stay at home and watch church online. Or, or I'm going to go elsewhere where I can blend in, where I won't have to have any responsibilities, or where things are just a little bit easier. Or I, I'm going to walk away altogether. I'm not going to invest my life in a lentil field. Uh, but Shama did. Either he was going to kill the Philistines or the Philistines were going to kill him, but he wasn't moving from that lentil field. What did Jesus say that following him is to be like? It's about denying ourselves and taking up our cross and following him. It's not about picking the easiest option. You young people, if you, you, you move away for, for university or, or for work, uh, don't just ask, well, well, what church are the other students going to? Uh, ask whether there are lentil fields where you can go and take your stand, M- maybe even ju- with just a handful of others, uh, and look to God to bless that. So thirdly tonight, some encouragement for when you feel you're serving God in an unglamorous situation. Lentil fields need defended. The fourth and final potentially discouraging situation is when we're left serving on our own. We've already seen this in passing with Shama and the lentil field. He's left uh, not only in an unglamorous situation, he's left serving on his own, uh, but particularly now we want to focus on Eleazar in verse 9. We read there that he was with David when they defied the Philistines that were gathered together to battle and the men of Israel were gone away. And yet the next verse goes on to tell us uh, that even though uh, the others had gone away, he arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave onto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to spoil Uh, to to gather the spoils. There are a couple of of interesting things about Eliezer that we don't have time to get into this evening. Uh, One is when these events took place, because there is an intriguing possibility that verse 9 is describing the aftermath of David killing Goliath. When the Israelites are chasing the Philistines, uh, I don't have time to go into the reasons uh, for, for why uh, uh, many people think that is the case. Uh, but if it is, the suggestion is that as, as the Israelites were pursuing the Philistines, that Eleazar's unit gave up, uh, they stopped pursuing, but he kept going. Uh, and the other thing I, I'm not going to uh, talk about this evening is the whole business of, of his hand cleaving or clinging to his sword. Uh, w- we could look at examples uh, from, from history uh, where this has happened, either because the, the blood has congealed and acted like glue, or, or because the muscles seized up and people literally couldn't let go of their swords. Uh, I, I did preach a whole sermon on, on Eleazar in Strenar where I get into those things. Uh, though though if, you, if you want uh, to, to read more on Eleazar, you're probably best just reading Spurgeon's sermon on him. A great sermon. I think it's called The Man Whose Hand a Cleave to His Sword. Uh, there's also there's, there's actually a Pilgrim's Progress character based on Eleazar. Uh, if anyone can tell me that after church, I'll be impressed because it's in, in part two of Pilgrim's Progress, uh, not, not part one, uh, which is the, the bit most people have read. But what I do want us to notice by Eleazar is that he isn't someone who followed the crowd. 
They went. They withdrew. He didn't. Everyone else is doing it. It wasn't an argument with him. Everyone else is running away. So what? No one else is taking the responsibilities seriously. So what? God may have given us ten talents or he may have given us one talent. But either way, on the day of judgment, we'll be called to answer for what we did with what God gave to us. Not to answer for what others did with what God gave to them. Too many Christians spend their time complaining about what other people are are doing or, or not doing with their talents rather than just using their own. And Eleazar, he he just gets on with it. He just gets on with it. And it's a a glorious thing. And yet, we do need to be aware that serving on your own or serving with very little help brings its own temptations. There's a temptation to discouragement. There's also the temptation to to spend a lot of time blaming others for not playing their part. There's a temptation for bitterness. If if only they would do this to save me from having to do that one thing on top of everything else. Perhaps we face the temptation to be despondent about the state of the church, whether the church of Christ in general or our own Uh, denomination or congregation but again our responsibility is for ourselves our calling is to be faithful to God in the place he's put us and with the responsibilities he's given us it's a lot easier to complain about others than get on with the job that God has given us Spurgeon says in that sermon on Eleazar It's very easy to pick holes in other people's work, but it is far more profitable to do better work yourself. And he asks, I think this is quite a convicting question, is there a fool in all the world that cannot criticize? It's not something to remember when we find ourselves being critical of others. It may be that our criticism is right, But it is also true that any fool can criticize. And though we find that high levels of criticism are usually paired with low levels of service. Those who who, who are good at criticizing, they're usually not so good at serving. Uh, One tends to replace the other. Spurgeon sums it up, therefore, if thou be wise, my brother, do not cavil at others, but arise thyself and smite the Philistine. Sometimes we perhaps need to remind ourselves that our responsibilities are not reduced by the laxness of others. And there can be the feeling, well, if people around me aren't serving God wholeheartedly, there's no point in me doing it. But that's that's totally the the wrong logic. Surely the failures of others should lead us to strive the harder, not to slacken off. Again, I find it hard to improve on Spurgeon, so I'll just quote him. He says, are your fellow Christians worldly? You yourself should be more spiritual and heavenly minded. Are they sleepy? Be you the more awake. Are they lax? Be you the more strict. Are they unkind? Be you the more full of love. Set your watch all the more strictly because you see that others are overcome. And be you doubly diligent where you perceive that others are negligent. The failures of others are are not to give us ammunition for criticism. Nor should they lead to us slackening off in our own service for God. Rather, they should lead to us being all the more diligent. And remember that your service to the king is not overlooked, even when you're left serving on your own. But just as we close this evening, a a final thing to encourage you to keep going is remember who you're serving. Remember who you're serving. Uh, As we... Uh, Remember at the start, ultimately our service, it's not for one another. And you are serving a far greater king than David. Think of what David's men were willing to do for him, and yet you are serving a far greater king, a far kinder king. 
There's one name on this list of 37 men that really sticks out. uh, And that maybe sticks in the throat a bit. And that's the very last name on the list. Did you notice it? Uriah the Hittite. Who was he? He's the one David had killed so that David could steal his wife. David was a king who at times took advantage of those who were serving him. Perhaps with those men who went to Bethlehem to get him water. Definitely with Uriah. But Jesus never does that. He is the greatest king. And also unlike David, Jesus doesn't actually need us to fight for him. David needed people to fight for him. Jesus doesn't. And yet he calls us to. And he honors us when he answers that call. To give the last word to Matthew Henry. Christ the son of David has his worthies too. Who like David's are influenced by his example. Fight his battles against the spiritual enemies of his kingdom. And in his strength are more than conquerors. And that sounds like a pretty good thing to give our lives to. Amen. Well, we close uh, with the second last psalm. Having, having looked at the second last chapter of, of 2 Samuel today, we come to the second last psalm. And verse 2 uh, reminds us of the starting point for our service. Uh, the starting point for our service uh, must, must not simply be duty, but joy in our king. Let Israel in his maker joy. Uh, let all the our Zion's children be joyful in their king. Uh, and remember as well, verse 4, uh, amazing words. Words we probably would not have dared write if they were not in scripture. How does God feel about his people? For God doth pleasure take in those his people be. Uh, remember as you serve him that he takes pleasure in you not simply in your service but in you uh, we will be be crippled in our christian lives our, our christian service if we think that that we serve so that one day he might take pleasure in us no his pleasure in us is the starting point for our service and and with that in mind verse 6 we take up the sword, the sharp two-edged sword. Uh, for us, it is the sword of the Spirit uh, that we might uh, go out and see the nations, the, the heathen, as they're called here. Well, yes, one day vengeance will be executed on the nations. The saints will judge the earth. Uh, but in the meantime, our call is to go out to the nations that we might see them turn, turn and put their faith in the Lord Jesus. So Psalm 149, verses 2 through 7, will stand to sing praise.
Our Father in heaven, we thank you that this list of names in front of us this evening has been a reminder that you are a God who does not overlook the service of your people. And we do confess uh, when we have done this, when we have overlooked uh, the, the service of your people who are serving away faithfully, or when we have only highlighted those who are serving publicly and so much service goes unnoticed. And we pray for any here who, who, who have felt what it is to be, to be overlooked in their service for you or, or only criticized rather than thanked. Uh, we pray that they would know this evening that even if they have experienced that from your people, uh, that, that, that that has not been a true representation of, of what you are like. We pray for any this evening who, who feel that they, they are wasting their energy or their gifts or, or they look back on their lives at, at a, a particular area of service perhaps over many years and they see so little fruit and they wonder whether they've wasted it. We, we pray that uh, you would remind them this evening that their service for you uh, was never wasted because it was a, a beautiful thing in your sight. Uh, we pray for any who, who feel that, that the place you've, you've placed them in, whether that's, that's where, they, where they live, uh, whether it's uh, the, the family situation that they're part of, whether uh, the congregation that they are part of, where they feel that it is not the ideal place to serve God. Uh, we pray uh, that, uh, that you would encourage them by highlighting uh, this man who, who stood uh, and, and fought in a lentil field uh, because he knew that God's people needed fed and he knew that once territory was lost to the Philistines, it would be very hard to get it back. And we pray as well for any who are serving this evening uh, in a particular area of service where they are, are on their own or, or they're all but alone in their service for you. Uh, we, we pray that uh, you would encourage them in that and that the, the fact that they look around and see people who, who could be serving, uh, who, who could be serving alongside them but, but aren't, we, we pray that you would guard them from the temptation to, to bitterness over that uh, but that it would simply encourage them to greater diligence knowing uh, that the Lord Jesus does not overlook even uh, the one who gives out a cup of cold water in his name. And so we pray that you would encourage us in these days in our service for you, knowing that we are serving a far greater king than David, even the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.